Hello and welcome to Christ Church in Oxford. Christ Church is unique in being a joint foundation, both a college of the university and a cathedral. And we're delighted in these open house evenings to open a window into this joint foundation and to engage in conversation between cathedral and college. Our guest tonight is Dr. Mishtuni Bose, who is the Christopher Tower student and tutor in medieval poetry in English. Mishtuni is going to be talking to us about Wycliffe, the English heresy. Then there'll be a chance for conversation. If you've got questions that you'd like to ask, please put them into the chat at any point during the session and during Mishtuni's um, talk to us at the beginning of this session. And then she and I will move into other areas of conversation before we finish tonight. Mishtuni, we're really thrilled to have you here tonight, and uh, I know that I'm very much looking forward to hearing um, about Wycliffe and the English heresy from you. Thank you. Thanks very much, and thank you very much, Richard, for this invitation. Um, it's great to participate. So what I decided to talk about this evening was a book that I'm writing called The English Heresy, that's the provisional title at least, uh, with the subtitle John Wycliffe and Lollardy, A 21st Century Perspective. The important thing about this is that it is designed for students, ordinands, interested members of the general public. Um, it's, a, it's meant to draw together a lot of existing scholarship on what we know about Wycliffe and Lollardy so that people have a one-stop shop, an introduction that they can go to when they're trying to grasp this enormous topic. Because actually there hasn't been a book of this kind for nearly 20 years and there needs to be a book for the interested general public, for students beginning their study of all of this. So that's very much the orientation of the book. Wycliffe himself died in 1384 um, in his bed. He died a natural death. But in 1428, in line with an edict issued at the Council of Constance 10 years previously, a very important council of the church, his bones were exhumed and burned and the, the, his ashes were cast into the River Swift in his local parish of Lutterworth. This act is also depicted in Fox's Acts and Monuments, otherwise known as the Book of Martyrs, which will be known to some people listening in. And it was clearly an act by which the church sought to purge itself once and for all of his influence, albeit decades after his death. But the act was symbolic and belated, and both Wycliffe and Wycliffeism continued to haunt the English church, even as the Bible that several of his collaborators and followers had produced became the publishing success of preprint England, easily outnumbering the works of Chaucer or Piers Plowman when we look at surviving manuscripts today. So the question then is why Wycliffe has this charisma and why um, the ideas associated with him have this tenacity. He started out as a philosophical controversialist, working very much within the confines of Oxford and of academic life. But his ideas started to have more of an extramural reach as he started to deal more systematically with issues of the church's relationship with public life, with the right of the church, for example, to hold extensive properties. His thinking on the Eucharist developed gradually. He always believed in the real presence, but the question for Wycliffe and for many of his followers is what form that real presence took. And the classic Wycliffeite belief about um, the Eucharist is close to what we would call consubstantiation, believing in the coexistence of bread with Christ's body and not um, as he might have been expected to believe, in the annihilation of bread as a substance when the words of the consecration were being spoken. So Wycliffe was prepared to challenge church beliefs. And there are several things, there are several emphases that I would want to place in this study. The first is that Wycliffe was not somebody who emerged from nothing. Wycliffe and his ideas emerge as part of a climate of reform. And this is something that people who are perhaps not as familiar with medieval life might not know. 
The protests and explorations in Wycliffe's writings did not appear out of the blue. The entire period from about, say, 1250 to 1550 has been persuasively characterised as an age of reform, and it certainly was this. It generated many severe critiques of particular religious orders or of lax attitudes and practices among the clergy. The church was continually involved in self-scrutiny and auto-critique. I don't think that would come as a surprise to any clergy listening to this, but it might come as a surprise perhaps to some more interested members of the general public. So during the, the period under discussion from around the 1370s to the 1500s, um, so Wycliffe's lifetime and beyond, the century beyond, reform was the big picture and heresy the detail. So we have to we have to ask what's distinctive about Wycliffe's ideas. And broadly speaking, the difference is that while many critiques of the late medieval church sought to reform it from within or to reform aspects of it or certain orders, certain um, behaviour by the clergy and so forth, Wycliffe's criticisms were radical in calling into question the structures, the identity, the authority of the church itself. And the historian Margaret Aston puts it very well when she says that for him, the church was defined spiritually, not structurally and individually rather than formally. And his views attracted support, but first within Oxford and then beyond it, so that even after his death, his ideas interacted provocatively with contemporary political circumstances, so that for several decades, both church and state saw his followers and ideas attributed to them as forces to be reckoned with. One of the most significant and lasting legacies of Wycliffeism is the sheer amount of writing that it produced. And much of that writing, whether in the form of sermons or polemics or theological explorations or translations or commentaries, is in English. It's one of the most significant things about it. Um, the first translation of the whole of the Latin scriptures into English was made by followers of Wycliffe and the enduring charisma of what is still known as the Wycliffeite Bible has led to a still popular but entirely erroneous assumption that Wycliffe himself translated all or part of it. There are things, though, that people tend not to know about Wycliffeism. And again, I'm thinking very much of the general interested reader. One is that Wycliffeite scholarship emerged from mainstream scholarship. It's not revisionist necessarily in its methods, but in its determination to break the boundary between intramural and extramural life, between the intellectual life fostered and nurtured and resourced within the university, and in this case Oxford, and the life of the church beyond it. It uses its ways of tr it translating, draw on existing scholarship and scholarly methods such as scriptural exegesis into English. And Wycliffe's followers were enterprising and energetic in harnessing existing scholarship and scholarly resources to this new end. And sometimes scholars can be a bit disappointed in a way that there's nothing radically different about Wycliffeite modes of scholarship. What is different, what is radical, is the kind of audience that they envisage. Um, the open university has deep roots in some ways in what the followers of Wycliffe were trying to do. And it also has to be said that we call this Bible the Wycliffeite Bible. It's often called the Wycliffeite Bible. I've called it that myself. But there are intriguing details about it that we're still learning to make sense of, such as, for example, only a handful of the existing around 250 manuscripts of the Wycliffeite Bible have the prologue written by followers of Wycliffe that is in many respects um, polemical and critical of the church and so forth. And so the Bibles could appear without this polemical prologue and could have been put to perfectly orthodox uses, because what could be more useful than a Bible in the native tongue? One example of an intriguing manuscript in this respect is a manuscript in the Bodleian Library, uh, Bodleian two, Bodley 277, a very large lavish, beautiful copy of the Bible, clearly not meant to be handled in any way clandestinely and apparently given by King Henry VI to the London Charterhouse. 
that's a story of orthodoxy interacting with the history of the Wycliffe Bible. And we are still trying to make sense of what these material traces of the Bible tell us. Another thing that people perhaps may not know is that Wycliffeites did not tend to write poetry, though there are odd and interesting exceptions to that. Um, uh, there's a, a sequence of poems called the Upland series, um, which involve a confrontation between Jack Upland, who voices many Wycliffeite views, and his uh, opponent, Friar Daw, um, as in Jack Daw. Um, and these two have a polemical exchange that touch on many of the important uh, Wycliffeite pressure points. And another poem called Pierce the Ploughman's Creed, which is an extraordinary mashup of Wycliffeite ideas and Piers Ploughman, and the, the poem Piers Ploughman. It's a kind of homage to Piers Ploughman, um, almost a fan fiction version of Piers Ploughman, much, much shorter than that original poem, in which um, the, a speaker, a narrator, appears at the beginning anxious that he doesn't know his creed, looking to someone who will teach him his creed. On his search for somebody who will teach him, he meets members of all the orders of friars who are of no use to him, do not help him at all, but criticise one another very energetically. And at the last, he manages to meet Pierce the Ploughman, who not only teaches him his creed, but endorses Wycliffe. So this is an extraordinary uh, merging of the two franchises, as we might now say, of Wycliffeism and the Piers Plowman tradition. Another point that I would want to make about Wycliffeism is that it wasn't necessarily in sync with some of the other religious explorations going on at the time. The late 14th century in England is an extraordinary renaissance. There isn't just one renaissance, there are many of them, and this is a period of great renaissance in the writing of English and in the exploration of theological ideas in English and of the making of dialects of English adequate for the expression of these views. It's the time of Julian of Norwich, it's the time of the cloud of unknowing author and so forth. But these different experiments, I think, have to be seen rather than somehow manifestations of the same spirit as very much occupying different spaces on a notional um, devotional map of the period. These people are coming at the question of theological exploration from different places. The cloud author would have been horrified, I think, by the Wycliffeites, whom I would imagine he would see as intellectually curious, which for him would not be a good thing. There is somewhere in the mix a shared interest in being devout, but what that means in, in, is different in each case. Julian's experimental language is about finding words for new experience, whereas Wycliffeite writings tend to be about translating existing modes of thought and are more cognate with the kinds of thinking and creativity that already existed in universities. They're generally more academic, even the Wycliffeite sermons, than being broadly experimental. So I would want to keep these strands very separate, whilst nevertheless using the opportunities afforded by writing a general study to explore what brings them perhaps close to one another in our perceptions rather than in the truth. So those are some of the issues that I will be covering in the study, and I'll be very happy to say more about that as appropriate. Thank you. And uh, I really look forward to the book coming out and uh, look forward to, to reading it in due course. I, I was really interested in your last point about the uh, mystics um, mm. and the kind of difference, in a sense, kind of experience versus rationality. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it, that in, in terms of success at the time, Wycliffe is a much more successful mm. author and stayed mm. well known throughout history. Whereas, of course, the cloud and the and the writings of Julian were, you, you, you know, not uh, didn't have that level of success. Um, no. I wonder if you you could just say something about why you think in the twentieth century and now in the twenty first, um, those experiential people are so much more popular. And you go into any Christian bookshop, and there'll be lots of copies of those books. You'd mm. be struggling to find much about Wycliffe in a Christian bookshop. Mm. That's a fascinating question. Um, thank you very much for it. You know, in some respects, 
it's to do with academia and the discovery of manuscripts and the way that that curricula have been shaped I think um, weirdly enough what you say about Wycliffe is absolutely right and as I said he you know he haunted the church for decades after his death and he never goes away in ecclesiastical histories for example of, of this period but oddly enough what happened in the 20th century is well by the 20th century although Victorian scholars were very assiduous in bringing out the Latin works of Wycliffe for example if you go into the lower reading room of, of um, the Bodleian you'll find the Latin works of Wycliffe um, that, that Victorian scholars brought out and we're very grateful to them for doing that. In the 20th century the study of Wycliffism in a way ran aground because scholars needed to learn something new about which sources to look at and the English sources were not taken as seriously as they might be. Um, when I say English sources I'm not talking about heresy trials which were always listened to by historians but the, the writings, the polemical writings, the sermons and so forth had to be rediscovered um, preeminently by Anne Hudson, a great scholar of this whole field who effectively reinvented the field by listening to these sources. Meanwhile, as, as Wycliffeism I think was was in the mid 20th century rather running aground um, people as I say were not yet listening properly to the English sources and to the English witnesses there was a revival for example um, a person I haven't mentioned um, Marjorie Kemp the book of Marjorie Kemp which is an early 15th century extraordinary testimony of the spiritual life of an English woman um, from East Anglia. The, the sole manuscript of that book, the book of Marjorie Kemp, was rediscovered in the early 20th century. So there was a publishing flurry around that. Um, and it's easy to go into Waterstones or Blackwells and find the book of Marjorie Kemp. Um, with Julian, I think one of, one of the things, one of the portals by which Julian came into the 20th century consciousness was of course T.S. Eliot. Um, and, you know, using a, a well-chosen line from Julian was able to reboot her in some ways in the popular imagination. And I think there's that. I wonder also if there's something to do with gender and also something to do with the fact that Wycliffe's ideas are very much keyed to their time. This is the important point that Wycliffe's May I mean one, one thinks about the most the bulk of his writing is polemical, and it's polemic directed to the state of the church in his time. It's not for all time. It's very much for a particular historical moment, the time of the Great Schism, when there were rival claimants to the papacy and so forth. And it's very much kept to that time. And time has unraveled those problems and solved them in other ways. Um, and the reformations of the 16th century have reformed all of those questions. Whereas with Julian, one goes into a sequence of moments which can appear to be ripped out of history. They can appear to transcend temporality very easily. And so it's not as difficult, perhaps, to think that we can make Julian our contemporary, whereas Wycliffe very obviously isn't. That's a rather long answer to your question, but I hope I've answered it. It's a fascinating uh, answer. Thank you very much. How accessible are the texts? You know, if I, I, you know, if I wanted to go and read a sermon, you know, would you be able to recommend one that I'd be able to get my head around quite easily? Or well, is it very dense? It's very dense. Um, and also the most accessible Wycliffeite sermons are the, what's called what we call the English Wycliffeite sermons, um, which were edited by Anne Hudson and Pamela Graydon. And they are not by Wycliffe. They are by followers of Wycliffe who were using his sermons um, as, and, and translating portions of them into English, but also developing their own sermons in English. So I would definitely say to somebody, read some of the English Wycliffeite sermons by all means. But Wycliffe's writings remain in Latin. Um, there are very, very few translations of them into modern English. And so that's that's a job that someone needs to do is simply to make the writings more accessible. But even were they to do that, I think that the Julians and the Marjories will always outgun Wycliffe because of that question of, of temporality and accessibility, I think. And, and following on from temporality, how much was he an influence uh, 
on the European Reformation. I mean, you call this the English heresy. Um, but did, did Luther read Wycliffe and take on board what Wycliffe was writing? Well, the great mediators between the generation of Wycliffe and the generation of Luther are the Hussites, um, Jan Hus. So if we talk about Wycliffe's influence, actually it starts to taper off and fade in England pretty early on in the 15th century. You know, after the 1410s, 20s, um, beyond the production of quote unquote Wycliffeite Bibles, which which was obviously something that was very successful, Wycliffeite ideas were to a great extent shut down. They stopped developing. The generation who were interested in developing those arguments either gave up or turned their attention to to other things. Whereas in Europe, what we would call Europe, um, Wycliffe's ideas did translate. Um, they they were influential in what was then called Bohemia. Um, to this day, there, Prague remains a great site of scholarship on Hussites, Wycliffeites and so on. And we're beginning to put together an understanding of what the relationships are between Wycliffeite thought, Hussites and then on to Luther. But I would want if I, if I was going to draw a dotted line between Wycliffe and Luther, I would want to plot it through Hussites and Hussitism. Yeah. And would would they have had texts? I mean, do we have manuscripts that have yes. their origins? Ah, yes. yes. There, there, there are some manuscripts of Wycliffe that are there. I mean, there are some Wycliffeite texts which, if you want to read them, you would have to go to Europe to do so. So, so they travelled. It's not always known by which routes they travelled or who was taking them, but they certainly did travel. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about the Bible and, um, you know, it was used by the Orthodox as well as the, mm. uh, those who were the, the perhaps less Orthodox. Um, mm. Did the translation itself um, reflect Wycliffe's views? I mean, did he use non-church language for some of the offices of the church or did his translations of Paul on the Eucharist, you know, avoid any implication of presence? I mean, you know, ha tell us how, how the text reflects that theology. This is the point. The text itself is completely unimpeachable um, and you could use the text. And as I say, if you had a manuscript of the, the Wycliffe, what we would call the Wycliffe Bible, let's call it the English Bible as well, because it is an English Bible. It's a Bible in English. You wouldn't necessarily know if it was appearing without its controversial prologue that you were reading something that had been associated with followers of Wycliffe. And my suspicion is that it was, as a suspicion, it's, it's, it's backed up by what is emerging in the scholarship, is that it was irresistibly helpful to perhaps parish priests, to people who wanted something in addition to the Latin Bible, who wanted, for example, uh, lectionaries, who wanted to be able to follow the readings through the liturgical year in English. Um, and it seems to have been a practical study aid, but very much within an orthodox tradition of study. So th there's a strand of scholarship or there's a strand of thinking that says we should call it the English Bible rather than the Wycliffeite Bible. And I can see why um, people might want to use that emphasis, um, because it would appear from the scholarship that's emerging on this, and it's still very much in its early days, but it is emerging that um, the Bible may have found its way through perfectly orthodox hands and been put to unimpeachable uses. One interesting thing about the manuscripts is that they're not all the same size, for example, um, that some are quite small, scrappy looking Bibles and others like Bodley 277 are gorgeous productions that are clearly not meant to be hidden anywhere. Um, so it looks, I mean, my own interpretation of this is that it, a lot of pragmatism may have won the day in that although the church passed, or Archbishop Arundel passed ecclesiastical legislation prohibiting the translation of the Bible into English unless um, authorised um, and, and prohibiting the dissemination of these kinds of texts, Nevertheless, it became a de facto publishing success because of the practicality and the usefulness of it. So you wouldn't necessarily know from the language 
Um, and the language is a, is a complicated thing as well, because there's what we call an early version and a later version of the translation. So there are actually two versions. I talk about the Wycliffeite Bible that's a bit misleading because the Bibles appear either with the early translation or the later translation. The later one is generally understood to be more idiomatic and easier to read. And how, I mean, you talk about the success and the widespread number of, of manuscripts. I mean, how successful was it? If I was a parish priest in Exeter, um, might I have a copy? It's possible. Um, it, you might. But as I say, we have about 250 manuscripts surviving, not all of them complete, I, sh I should say, but um, in, in various forms. Um, and it's it's possible. What we what we don't know enough about, though, at the moment, as far as I'm aware, is how by what method these Bibles were commissioned and disseminated. We still don't don't have exhaustive information on who was doing this copying, where it was being done, what resources they had available to them. That's a, a picture that's gradually emerging. And there are a lot of enigmatic silences still in the history of that Bible. Thank you. I wonder if we could move on to the wider culture of Wycliffe's time, and, and, and particularly for us now thinking about plague um, and the existence of plague. Is there any kind of, does his, his, his theology reflect that the, the, the people are, are surrounded by people who are dying? You know, I mean, is that uh, evident in his theology? I would say for Wycliffe himself, not overwhelmingly. Um, his, his concerns tend to be more intellectual, ecclesiastical, institutional. So I don't associate him primarily with you know, a, th a theology of the plague years. But one thing that, that would be relevant here, perhaps a bit more so, is that the point I made at the beginning, that his ideas emerge out of a general climate of reform. There, were, th there are writers that continue to be reformist before, during and after Wycliffeism. And people, in a sense, whom Wycliffeite thinking for whom Wycliffeite thinking created difficulties because the existence of Wycliffeism made it difficult in some ways to criticise what the church was up to or the behaviour of clergy and so on without becoming identified with Wycliffeism. So there, there was a problem there. The Wycliffeite heresy in some ways spoils the Reform Party. But perhaps a, you know, a more general climate of, of reformism sits alongside those years of the plague, which of course wasn't a, a once and for all occurrence. I mean, plague recurred um, throughout European history uh, in, in decades, centuries afterwards. It, it wasn't simply the Black Death. There were outbreaks of plague at, at regular points. So you can see how a climate of reform would fit with the urgency of plague and with the disaster of plague. But Wycliffe himself, I don't associate that closely with with that dimension of social history. Thank you. Um, I'm quite interested in, you know, at the moment, lots of people in the church are talking about the institution needs to change as a result of the pandemic and, right. and, and the media that we're using to communicate um, the Christian uh, message is changing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I spend uh, more time praying on Zoom now than I do praying in the cathedral. Um, and, um, you know, we, none of us know yet how long term that's going to be. Um, and what it will be like afterwards. And there is also resistance to that as well. People are very uncomfortable with that. We're having to work out what that means and, and what's that, that, what that's like. And I, I, it just occurs to me that the, the whole idea of using the, this new medium of English language, in a sense, to communicate the gospel for Wycliffe has a relevance to us in that. I don't know whether that, that rings any bells for you. Yes, I mean, one of the problems, I mean, one of the another group of people I'm very concerned with are opponents to Wycliffeism, because they are they, they are reasonable, interesting, intellectually creative people too. Um, that the book is not going to be party pre in a, in a sense. Um, and one of the big anxieties about Bible translation, which I know has never gone away, it will be no news to to people who are informed about this listening in, is the problem of interpretation. 
the, the fear was that if the Bible was available in the native tongue, in this medium, you know, in an unregulated medium of books that, that could not be scrutinized, could not be censored, could not, whose dissemination, manuscript dissemination could not be regulated in any way, the fear was that people would, that would then lead to um, rogue or anarchic interpretations of scripture. And that, I think, is all is a perennial worry, isn't it, about the openness of interpretation, about who has the authority to interpret, which interpretations will result and what structures will be built on the basis of those interpretations. So that was very much a fear of the church at the time and of opponents of Wycliffism. And it seems to tap into what you're talking about, too. There's, the, there's always the question of the relationship between openness and the dynamic between openness and control and what kinds of regulation are necessary, which are, which are confining, which are enabling, and so on. Those, those problems never seem to go away. No, and about control and institutional control very much as well. And I think one of the things that's frightening for, at the moment for some people is that in Zoom, of course, we've got no control. It all happens. People can do it in their own homes, you know, so, uh, which is interesting. I've had a question come in. Um, I think I've asked the first question that we've had in, but somebody has asked how many Latin copies of the Bible exist for the same sort of period as Wycliffe. I suppose to work out you know, if there are 250 Wycliffe Bibles, mm. how many Latin Bibles do we have from the period? Um, I would suspect far more, although one thing I would want to say about that is that, of course, the, La the, the Latin Bible was something that, that was Europe-wide. That, that There's a strange phenomenon, really. People, When people talk about translating into English, I think a, a modern assumption about that is making it more accessible but of course in this period the decision to translate into a vernacular was a decision to restrict an audience um the, the vulgate bible w was europe wide but i should i should emphasize of course for for catholic christians ownership of a latin bible w w was absolutely not what was required what people would have had was books of hours for example and I say people, I mean, well off people who could commission such a thing, books of hours. So prayer books, effectively books with the seven penitential Psalms, um, the mass for the dead, for example, um, books that were passed passed down in families um, through the generations. So a book of hours would be what a household might have rather than a Bible, as we might expect. <coughs> There will there there'll be there will have been far far more Latin copies of the Bible um, than there were than there are copies of the Wycliffeite Bible. It's just that when you compare the numbers of Wycliffeite Bibles to copies of Chaucer's works, Canterbury Tales, Piers Plowman, things that people tend to have heard of from this period, um, there are only about seventy or so manuscripts um, of Chaucer, two hundred and fifty of the Wycliffeite Bible. That tells a story because of the manuscript for the manuscripts that survive, there will have been um, a certain number that we have lost. Yeah, that's very interesting. The number of Chaucer in comparison, I think, uh, is 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 very interesting. Uh, you you obviously poetry is is important. You've talked about some Wycliffeite poetry. Um, and you've mm. talked also about uh, the use of Julian by T.S. Eliot mm. in, in, in poetry. I, I wonder if we could just move on to this other big area of interest for you and, mm. um, and think about how poetry um, <coughs> helps us to express some uh, things of importance to us. I don't want to say spiritual because I think it's much, much more than that. And, and, and you know, how that fits with your work. Well, the, it, it fits in all sorts of interesting ways. I mean, one of the things that I, I had um, bookmarked that I could have talked about if, if I'd run out of things to say in, in the talk part of this is that the period in which Wycliffe was active is absolutely a period of great experimentalism in, in English poetry of all kinds. And when we talk about English at this period, we're not talking about a single language. We're talking about a language fragmented into dialects. Um, so the question is how these different dialects can be made adequate for the expression of all sorts of ideas, including religious ideas. But just to give a couple of examples from the period, um, and we can move on to other things after that. But a couple of examples that I thought to mention that I'm writing about at the moment as part of a separate project. Um, there's a, a, 
very strange uh, late medieval English poem, which has the modern title, Why I Can't Be a Nun. That's not a contemporary title, but it's, it's one that modern editors have given it. And it is um, a, spoken by a woman who has a vision. Um, she's contemplating whether or not to become a nun, but she has a vision that shows her how corrupt nunneries can be, how corrupt convents are. And the vision is shown to her by um, a, a, an allegorical character called Lady Experience. Um, and it's Experience that shows her, and it's called, the character is actually called Experience, shows her um, all the problems of convents, um, all, the, all the ways in which nuns do not obey their rule and so on. And this confirms her in her decision that she has not got a vocation. There's another poet, um, John Audley, um, who was a chantry priest at the beginning of the 15th century, who wrote a, a body of poetry, which is all in the Bodleian Library in a single manuscript. And he also, a lot of his poetry is devotional, but it's also reformist. And in, in one poem, the speaker of the poem is warning church, the church and churchmen um, that they're being scrutinized. And one of the characters that he invokes that will go amongst them and report on them is a character called experience. So experience is being harnessed to reformist ends in these very different kinds of poems. And it, it's very interesting to see how the language of poetry and poetic traditions are brought together with religious reformism in this period. That's fascinating. And that, that use of experience in that way is fascinating as well. I, I, I think there are a few people I might recommend uh, why I can't be a nun to, but uh, that's another yeah. story. Yeah. But tell me a little bit more about poetry and poetry in your own life. And, uh, you know, it, if you're going to reach out to the bookshelf after you've finished mm. talking to me tonight, actually might not be poetry you want, but, but uh, if it were poetry, what, what might you reach out for? Well, uh, the, the people that I tend to read are um, the old classics, as it were. Um, for example, I mean, I mentioned John Audley. I mean, they, there you have a priest whose poems exist in a single manuscript. Um, and that brings to mind, for example, a, a, a much later writer, George Herbert, who, who is somebody I keep going back to. Um, and again, thinking of the temple as a book in which you can encounter um, Herbert's poetry and that, that, that holds his poetry together in that collection. So he's somebody that I sometimes go back to. Yes, and, and Herbert, <laughs> Herbert remains enormously popular, and I don't want to, to lose Herbert this evening, as you know, but uh, um, and you've mentioned T.S. Eliot, who's a little bit out of fashion. When I trained as a priest 27 yeah. years ago, yeah. Eliot was the thing, you know, and um, uh, it doesn't yeah. seem to be so now. I'm, I'm not sure why. I wonder if we, you can reflect on that at all. That's, re that's a, a really interesting thing. It, it, it was once suggested to me, and this was way back in the 90s, um, by, by Anne Oxford Don, um, who said to me that the reason that, that Eliot became popular was that he was one of the, the easiest people to teach in a tutorial, but I, I'm sure that's, that's absolutely not true. But it was the idea that certain writers, and he also mentioned John Donne, you know, became popular because they had they were the perfect tutorial size poet. Um, Eliot uh, is, it's an interesting point because when I was an undergraduate, he seemed to carry all before him. Um, but I think that there are these natural periods of exhaustion and wastage um, people who are very, very much in the foreground go into the background. There's, there's a period um, of great flourishing and then they move into the background. If I think of the 15th century, for example, by contrast, uh, when I was an undergraduate, you would never have read Wycliffe as part of an Oxford English degree or the book of Marjorie Kemp was only just beginning to make its way into that, in, into the the reading of, 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 an, of an English student, for example, Julian possibly, uh, but there are lots of things that, that students read now and that I teach that you simply would not have found because the 15th century has found its way critically since the 1980s. And so some periods have come very much into the foreground again. Um, the 15th century was cast under a shadow, I think by C.S. Lewis, you know, called it the drab age. And that exerted a lot of influence on people's perception of it. It absolutely isn't the drab age at all, but it, it, it was under that curse for a long time. 
has that came more into the foreground but other writers you know T.S. Eliot is one I mean thinking of prose D.H. Lawrence is another simply I don't know they, they seem to recede but again I mean we say they seem to recede they don't recede for graduate students for people who are undertaking scholarship at that level I think there's a, a difference between receding in the popular um, imagination and and receding elsewhere so it's it's a relative thing I think I'm sure that's right I've I've really only re discovered Marjorie Kemp in the last few years um, I'd always kind of had this there is a snobbish view among some in the church that she was a hysterical woman who had ridiculous visions, um, whereas the nice um, Julian of Norwich was much more kind of ordered. Of course, Julian is full of visions and, 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 and things. But, um, and, and, uh, you know, I wonder actually, even as I say this, whether there's some kind of uh, anxiety about a married woman as compared to somebody, um, uh, uh, you know, holed up in a cell somewhere. But uh, talk to me about Marjorie Kemp and, and yes. you, you know, and how, how we might access her more. Well, I see the interesting thing about Mar that Marjorie is that she, well, I hold the view anyway that that she did not write anything. Um, that we have we have the book of Marjorie Kemp, and the book of Marjorie Kemp, in other words, the book about Marjorie Kemp, is very much presented as a book that's being mediated to us by a process. So it starts with an in it, with a preface in which the the laborious composition of the book is described. Um, and it's Marjorie taking her experiences to different scribes who then transcribe what she has said. So the question when you read the book of Marjorie Kemp, even if one's looking at, say, a penguin version of it, is to try to think about whose voice one is hearing, because the voice primarily that we're hearing is the voice of the male scribe who is narrating the story. Um, and even critics make this error of conflating that with Marjorie, the subject, and talking about Marjorie as an author. Um, whereas I've heard a much more compelling account of what may have happened, which is rather like if if you get involved in, let's say, a road traffic accident, you have to go to the police station and give an account of it. You give an oral account. Uh, the policeman will write it down um, and will then read it back to you and say, is, is this your statement? And the question then is, who has voiced that? Whose statement is it? Whose voice are we hearing in the statement? There's a question there about Marjorie Kemp's book and whose voice we are hearing. So it's a much more interesting blend of voices. Um, and some of the chapters in it, they're very short chapters, actually draw attention not to Marjorie, but to the scribe who's writing the book and to his incredulity at some of the things he was hearing her say and to some of his exasperation with her crying. You, you mentioned the exasperation with Marjorie that some people feel. That's written into the book itself. It anticipates all of that. Um, and it, it tries to deal with that by saying, but this is what continental women saints did. And it, so it aligns a lot of her practices with continental women saints like Bridget of Sweden and, and so on, uh, Marie of Wanyi and so on. So it's always trying, seeking to legitimate her. And that process of legitimation is a process with which male scribes would have been much more familiar so it, there's, there's an interesting question of voicing in the book of Marjorie Kemp, and I think that's, that's a fresh way to approach it. Thank you. Um, that's really helpful. On International Women's Day, I think that's a particularly powerful um, uh, way of thinking about Marjorie Kemp as well, and um, it has made me want to go back and re-reread it. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I, I'm so grateful, Mish Tooney, for, for, for this evening. That's been really helpful and, and, and really interesting. Um, you and I talked about George Herbert when we spoke last, last week, and you told me your favourite poem by Herbert. So I'd like to end with you reading that poem, The Flower, which is just uh, amazingly sumptuous and full. Um, but, and, 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 and I'd like to make that the very last words we hear tonight. So I, I'm going to say my thank you and goodbye now so that we can um, listen to George Herbert and really appreciate it. So an enormous thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you to everybody who's been watching and listening and will over the next few days and, and perhaps even weeks. Next week we have um, Richard Barker who's going to talk about can 
companies care um, and the social and environmental impact of companies. So we're moving through some very different subjects in our open house events, but I'm enormously grateful um, to have the opportunity for these conversations. Mish Tooney, thank you, and let's hand over to you and George Herbert. The Flower by George Herbert, 1633. How fresh, O Lord, how sweet and clean are thy returns, even as the flowers in spring, to which, besides their own demean, the late past frosts tributes of pleasure bring. Grief melts away like snow in May, as if there were no such cold thing. Who would have thought my shriveled heart could have recovered greenness? It was gone quite underground, as flowers depart to see their mother root when they have blown, where they together, all the hard weather, dead to the world, keep house unknown. These are thy wonders, Lord of power, killing and quickening, bringing down to hell and up to heaven in an hour making a chiming of a passing bell. We say amiss, this or that is. Thy word is all, if we could spell. Oh, that I once past changing were, fast in thy paradise, where no flower can wither. Many a spring I shoot up fair, offering at heaven, growing and groaning thither. Nor doth my flower want a spring shower, my sins and I joining together. But while I grow in a straight line, still upwards bent, as if heaven were mine own, thy anger comes and I decline. What frost to that? What pole is not the zone where all things burn, when thou dost turn? and the least frown of thine is shown. And now in age I bud again. After so many deaths I live and write. I once more smell the dew and rain and relish versing. O oh, my only light, it cannot be that I am he on whom thy tempests fell all night. These are thy wonders, Lord of love, to make us see we are but flowers that glide, which when we once can find and prove, thou hast a garden for us where to bide. Who would be more, swelling through store, forfeit their paradise by their pride? 